Thank you for tuning into this video. This is going to be posterior composite fillings. Uh, my name is Dr. Brad Revering. I'm a dentist in Flower Mound, Texas. Here we have two molars that are going to be worked on in the form of placing direct restorations. You can see in the one that does not have the amalgam, I have an arrow pointing to this area between the two areas of marked decay. And that is a transverse ridge. The decay remains isolated to those two areas, then we will not across the transverse ridge, keeping the strength of that tooth intact. So there's no need to connect it unless the decay was actually running between those two cavities. Okay, so when I'm going in with um, my, uh, my prep, I'm going to use this kind of fat diamond burr, uh, probably about 80-90% of the time. It just does a good job of efficiently removing the area of decay and unsupported enamel. Uh, for this video, I've turned off the light on the handpiece. I'm also not using water, and I'm not using my loops. I'm actually prepping from kind of a distance. Uh, so it's going to be going a little bit slower than if it was in a real live clinical setting. Um, and you can tell I'm just going to work on doing uh, these two cavity preps with kind of a brushing motion. I'm just going to be going back and forth, buccal lingual, uh, just trying to remove the decay without a lot of downward pressure. I found that even if a patient is very numb, by pushing hard apically, uh, they can feel it. Also, I like to use these diamond burrs instead of carbide burrs because under magnification, I can tell that the carbide burrs can cause uh, micro cracks or craze lines within the enamel. Um, uh, then partway through, or even when I think I'm done, I will go in with an air water syringe and blow off the debris and just evaluate to see if there's any remaining areas of decay or if there's any uneven or rough edges. Okay. All right, uh, we're going to assume that this tooth has interproximal decay, and we're going to remove the uh, silver filling first. i uh, like to get that part out of the way, and then we can move on to work on the interproximal. Um, again, if I was using water, this would be a much cleaner prep than what's being shown here. Uh, but again, just going back and forth, uh, removing the decay, I tend not to stay in one spot terribly long. Uh, just for the reason I don't want to heat up the tooth in that area. Um, and periodically I'll stop, go through, uh, rinse it off, and, uh, and just continue on with, with my prep. And of course when we get down to the deeper areas, uh, as you know a lot of times these amalgams will leave behind kind of a dark uh, dentin stain. And I'm not going to concern myself with removing that. Only if it's decay will I remove it. Um, during this presentation, you're going to see I'm not going to use a slow speed handpiece with a round burr. Um, most of the time, I can get all the, the decay removed with just the simple uh, high speed handpiece. But I will use the uh, slow speed when the decay gets pretty deep and gets close to the, uh, to the pulp chamber. I will definitely use that. And when I think I'm getting to the point where that decay is, is all gone, I will make sure that I uh, apply a little extra pressure just to make sure all the decay is gone. Um, okay, so now I've rinsed off that tooth and now I'm going to evaluate it and oh, there's still a little bit of silver filling left right back there. didn't see it because it wasn't being blown away with a bunch of water and air like it would be normally in a clinical setting. So go ahead and remove that little bit of amalgam. And, um, and as I'm also going around and prepping, I'm just going to go around the edges to make sure that all the walls are nice and smooth. If you remember the shape of this burr when I first started, it is going to result in a divergent prep. Uh, you know, if you do amalgams, you have to have more of a convergent prep to keep the non-bonded amalgam in place. But since this is going to be composite, it's going to be bonded. Whether it's convergent or divergent is less of an issue than if it was amalgam. <clears throat> okay, so now what I'm working on is moving interproximally, moving towards that wall, making it thinner and thinner. Uh, the idea being is to create your cavity prep, remove the decay. Uh, and to try to minimize the, the risk of, of dinging up or scratching or scuffing the neighboring tooth. And so as you see, I'm just going back and forth in a buccal lingual uh, direction, making that wall thinner and thinner. Uh, in this example, I've just, take, I've just taken these two extracted teeth and put them in uh, the stone, stone block. And the teeth are a little bit further apart than what we would normally see clinically. Uh, and so you're going to see when we finally get it prepped that it is kind of a wider space. And so now you can see I'm getting closer. I think I may actually have separation at this point between those two teeth. 
Uh, but we're just going to smooth up the sides, and then I'll be switching over to a different burr. I just used the more traditional uh, burr. It's skinnier than the other one. And this is now we're getting into the interproximal buccal and lingual areas and along that gingival floor. Uh, we just want uh, more control over the removal of the enamel, and so this burr uh, makes that makes that possible. So again, just brushing back and forth, being careful not to scuff the neighboring tooth. If that does happen, no big deal. We can go in with a, a, a fluted finishing burr, which you'll see here in a moment, and we can smooth up that wall. Uh, you got to have a smooth wall in order to place a good interproximal contact. Okay, and now I think I'm moving on to that third burr, which is the uh, fluted carbide finishing burr. Uh, that should be coming up here in a second. This is just showing the prep, and the edges look a little rough right now. I do have uh, separation, but now I'm going to take this burr and smooth up that interproximal uh, wall, the buccal, the lingual, and the gingival part of that floor. Um, composite likes to go into smooth. Uh, areas as opposed to rough, uh, jagged areas of decay. Or, I'm sorry, uh, of, of the enamel. Okay, and just turning it around and trying to evaluate to see how smooth that looks. And we've got separation, and that should work out great. Um, it's not unusual then to go along with a hand instrument uh, just to just to make sure everything is fine. Yeah, we're going to check the floor of the tooth, make sure all the decay is removed, nothing is sticky. Uh, that dentin is, is solid, it's hard, so we feel pretty confident now about placing a filling in that area. I'm going to take a scaler and just, just to smooth that wall, just to make sure that we're going to have a nice gingival part of the, um, of the filling when we put in our matrix. And so there's the prep. We use the garrison system, the sectional matrix, the convex part is going to go uh, face towards the gingival. Uh, so just slide that in with the cotton forceps. And then we'll just hold it in place while we insert the wedge. Like I stated earlier, these two teeth are separated further than what we would normally uh, see clinically. And most of the time I will use that uh, light blue wedge. That's why I probably use probably, oh gosh, 95% of the time. Uh, but in this case, it is, um, you'll see here in a moment, it is just too loose to fit in there. Also, the shape of these different wedges. If you can just look at the front of it, it looks kind of like the, like a canoe. And so the part of the canoe that would be in the water, that's the part that's going to be facing gingivally. Um, it's important to get it oriented the right way so that your contact uh, will have the right shape. And this one is just more of a rectangular shape. It's a real thick wooden wedge. It's probably not the best anatomical shape. But for teeth that are wide apart, it will work out. It'll work out quite fine. Now, the main goal, of course, is to get a good gingival seal while you're getting your your filling placed. So here I'm going to try in the the one that I would normally use, but it just slides in too easily. There is no wedging effect coming from that. It's not going to stabilize that matrix band. So I'm going to use this thicker thicker wedge and just slide that right in there to create a good embrasure or to maintain the embrasure that the matrix band is, uh, is allowing us to make and pushing it into position. Just get it nice and snug. You don't have to shove it really hard, just enough to get that, that sectional matrix stabilized. Next we're going to place the bitine ring. Uh, these come in different shapes and sizes. I happen to like this gold or brass colored one from Garrison. Uh, the, the tines seem to be quite strong when you put them in place. Using the ring forcep, I'm going to place the tines of the ring uh, between the actual matrix and the wedge. We would never place this on top of the wedge, uh, but you can alternatively place it on the other side of the wedge, but that's, that's, not, the, that's not the best way to do it, but if you need to do it to, to have the wedge kind of push against a long prep, uh, you can do that as well. But this is the ideal setting, is to have that bintine ring. Uh, if there's any question about how tight the contact is going to be, most of the time just the bitine ring will separate it enough, but this contact former uh, comes in handy. We'll use it in this demonstration to just push that matrix band against the adjacent tooth to just ensure we get a nice tight contact. You see it has a slight curve to it. 
It's marked mesial distal, so when you're in the mouth, you can orient it the right way. Of course, the luxury of having this stone block, uh, I don't know if that's mesial or distal, but uh, the main point is that we're going to be able to push uh, to create that contact with that instrument. Okay. Okay, so first step we're going to do whenever placing a filling, or even a buildup for that matter, is we're going to use this product called Microprime by Danville Engineering. It's a glutaraldehyde based uh, desensitizer as well as a cleaning agent. You also notice the label in that bottle is green. We use a green brush. You'll see coming up in the next steps, we use different colored brushes. So if we're doing multiple fillings, we can uh, make sure that the brushes don't get mixed up. Um, we used to just drop the, the material right from the bottle onto the brush, but we've since went to just using these dappen dishes. Um, it just makes it more efficient. It makes it cleaner, neater, and also less material will be wasted. Um, and the, the idea behind here is to just uh, apply the, the solution, scrub it around on the teeth, and then blot dry, go back and forth from the patient's bib uh, to, the, to the tooth, uh, just trying to remove the excess. Of course, we're going to make sure we've got good isolation, absolutely no saliva is coming in. We use dry angles and cotton rolls. Whenever I'm going to dry a prep, I'm going to always test it on a mirror. I'm going to depress the air button and just make sure there's no spritz of water that's going to come out and contaminate the prep. So here I'm going to just dry this, uh, dry these teeth. I'm going to get it to its point, to the point where it's just gotten dry. Uh, we're not going to over dry it, but we're not going to leave a puddle of the material either. So um, it's kind of like if you licked your finger and blew on it, that's to the point right where you want to get it as far as wetness. All right. So second step is this, um, the, the primer, the self etching primer. We use the purple brush for primer, PNP. Again, get a brand new dappen dish. We'll go through three dappen dishes during this process. And uh, we'll just put in one drop. It's kind of a small drop. We'll see if it's going to make it all the way through. I don't think it will. But let's go ahead and just apply this first one. And again, we just scrub it. Scrub it along the dental floor. Scrub it along the side walls. Get it up and over the cable surface margin. Uh, yeah, that wasn't enough. So let's grab another, let's grab another uh, drop. And this material must be worked in and be contacting the surface for uh, a minimum of 10 seconds. So we use that time. By the time you apply it, scrub it, and blot dry, and then go in with your air to thin it, and that will be 10 plus seconds for that whole process to take place. And again, we're just trying to remove the excess so there's no puddles. Uh, then we're going to go in with, uh, again, test the air water tip. We're going to thin out this material. We're not here to blow the material off. We just want to thin it out. Uh, again, we want that just barely moist uh, appearance to it, a slight glisten. All right, the third step we're going to use is the blue brush here, the blue for bond for the adhesive. And this is step two in the, um, in the Danville uh, bonding system. Um, again, use the dappen dish. And we'll apply our adhesive. Of course, this adhesive is working chemically with the bottle that just came before it and these two materials will blend together to lock the uh, resin into the tooth. Again here we're going to go and do just like we did before. We're just going to scrub the, uh, the, the solution into, into the cavity preps. We'll rotate the brush, we'll scrub back and forth, uh, just making sure it's getting worked well into the dentin. Uh, you know, think of dentin as kind of living tissue. You have those dentin tubules you have to get that material down inside there. Uh, the enamel, of course, is more inorganic, uh, but it too will soak in this material. Uh, when it comes time to dry this area, we're going to just thin it out. We're not trying to blow it off the teeth. I mean, there's no point in putting something on the teeth just to blow it right off. It's part of the if it's part of the overall process. Uh, we just want to thin this out, and this uh, I'd rather it puddle rather than be blown off if we're going to air. Air, I'm leaving a little bit too much. But again, just try to thin it out. It's great if you can actually blow it so that it blows up and over the cable surface margin so that it kind of gets some of the unprepped areas sealed off as well. Okay. And now it's time to cure. We use the Demi Plus and it comes in a couple different uh, lengths of time that you can, you can cure. I'm just going to set it on the five second and uh, cure each tooth. 
I'm just gonna hover right over the tooth, maybe one millimeter away from the surface. I try not to touch the actual tooth surface, uh, but just try to keep it close. If you remember from physics, the further away you carry a light from the, from the target, the less uh, energy you have traveling to that target. So keep it close to the tooth. Okay, going in next with a little bit of flowable composite, just a dab we'll put in there. Okay, and then followed, following next will be a regular hybrid composite. I'll put it right over the top where that flowable is. I'll take a little bit of that first piece off to make sure I have a fresh, fresh amount coming out. And squeeze it in there, peel it off. Go ahead and fill in these other ones. Let's try to do multiple surfaces uh, in one increment. That just makes it more, uh, more efficient. Oh, piece fell out right there. Let's try again. Push it into position and smear it and it will stay in place. Okay, so let's start packing this stuff into position. I'm just using a, I call it a, a plugger instrument. It just has a flat surface. It's round, barrel shaped with a flat surface and just packing it into position. And that interproximal area, I'm just making sure when I push it in there that flowable is kind of oozing up on the buccal and lingual surfaces. And as I'm going over to, these, to this other tooth with the two smaller fillings, as I'm pressing the material down, I'm also going to pull it uh, across the, the teeth laterally just to get a kind of feathering it into position. And optionally, I can go in with that last brush, that blue brush that has the bond on it, and just, like I said, feather the edges to get a, make sure that we have a, a very nice seal all the way around. Okay, now going to that uh, interproximal box, I'm putting in that contact former. I'm pressing down, rotating it up and my assistant will come in with the curing light right on top of that platform uh, to, cure the, to cure the top and that will go all the way down that tip to cure that gingival box. I'll then go in and cure the other tooth. Again, five seconds is all that's required. Now that instrument I used, as a result, it's going to leave, you see that little tip right there, it's going to leave an indention inside that prep right there. Okay. That needs to be filled in, make sure there's no air bubbles. So to ensure that gets filled in all the way and doesn't trap any air, I'll then go back in and put a small dab of flowable, just a little bit, it's all it requires. And then I'll come back again with a hybrid composite and put that in right over the top of it. And I will build up that marginal ridge. Okay, so just kind of pack it along there, making sure to push down gingerly to make sure it gets patted down all the way, get that excess piece out of the way. And then I'm going to take and push. We'll see it here in just a moment. I'm getting the right vertical height. But now I'm going to push just to make sure that that, that marginal ridge is fully enforced with, uh, with enough composite. And just to kind of help save time with shaping it later, I'll take a flat instrument like this and just go right between the matrix and the composite just to try to round over that marginal ridge, start to create somewhat of a gingival embrasure. And so I'm just kind of getting the initial shape of that. It's kind of crude at this point. We'll get it fine-tuned later, uh, but just kind of getting it in position. Now I may have leaned it too far towards the middle, so now I'm just taking, taking and leaned it back again with that material. And I'll go over the top of it, flatten it down to make it a, a nice thick ridge. Okay. So now I'll go ahead and cure that. And so at this point, now that I have the, the interproximal wall and marginal ridge taken care of, the resulting part that needs to be filled in is just like a class one filling. And I don't go in and just fill a bulk, a bulk fill. I'll just use an incremental composite. And uh, right now I'm just gonna go ahead and do that other side of the tooth. Again, packing it down, but then feathering it up along the cusps, trying to get some initial shaping done um, don't want to, well, I like to overfill a little bit, but I don't like to do too much because then it just creates more time uh, needed to, to trim it back later. And as we cure with these composites, as you remember, it does shrink, so try to keep the number of walls that the composite is touching to a minimum. Here I'm only using three walls as opposed to packing the whole thing and layering it up. Vertically, I'd be touching all four walls. You want to just have it pull on the fewest number of walls possible. Okay, here's the last increment going into place. 
making sure it adapts well up to the marginal ridge, to the other increment that was just placed. Again, trying to form the, the pits, the grooves, making sure it goes up the cuspal inclines, and just kind of getting the initial shape together. Again, this is an optional step, but you can take this brush with a little bit of bonding agent on it and just go through and make sure that all the cable surface margins are well sealed. Okay, final cure. <coughs> Okay, go with the ring forcep, remove the ring, pop out the, uh, the wedge. A lot of times you'll find this sectional matrix is going to stick to the composite that was placed. And uh, you have to make sure you free up as much of that as you can before you try actually lifting it out of position. Uh, so take this, and if, since that's the last instrument I use, I'll use it to try to pull it back. Uh, I know this one right here, it's adapted well, so take a flat instrument to free up that buckle or lingual side, whichever that is. Try to pull it out. No, nope, can't do it with the cotton forceps, so move in with the hemostats. Grab an edge, lock it into place, and then just start pulling. So even in these two teeth that were in this block, there's no PDL ligament allowing them to spread apart. We got a pretty nice contact uh, by using the bi-tine ring and pushing with the, with the, um, with the contact former. All right, so first step on our interproximal filling, I'll go back with this uh, flame-shaped carbide burr and just start removing some of the flash that's on the buckle and lingual surfaces. And I'll drag it across and uh, the occlusal embrasure, just trying to get that opened up so that it'll be flossable. Of course, don't want to open it too much and create an open contact. Uh, then I'll go in with the football finishing burr and just angling it uh, to ride along the direction of what the cusps are. So just start creating that, start uh, using this back and forth movement, uh, keeping in mind that the tip should be right down where the, where the cusp, I'm sorry, right where the pit is. Uh, start getting that formed. And just changing the direction of the, of the angulation of the burr just to kind of help mimic the actual tooth anatomy so the filling will, will fall in line with it. And again, I'll do this in the mouth with, with water. It makes it for a much more efficient uh, reduction. When we do get to the final steps, intraorally, uh, in a clinical situation, I will then turn off the water just to make sure that any little ripples across the uh, surfaces have been smoothed out. And if there's any flash that's on the edges, it's much easier to see when it's dry as opposed to having water flow over the tooth. And so again, just trying to uh, do like I was doing on the other tooth, just trying to reestablish the, the correct anatomy. You can, as an optional step, use this kind of burr. It kind of reminds me of the instruments we used to use on amalgams in trying to shape uh, a more distinct pit and grooves. So I'll put that right where the main pit of the tooth is, and then I'll then radiate from that point. Uh, moving along where other grooves are and then going up the, uh, the buccal and lingual grooves, just trying to recreate again the anatomy of the tooth. And then I always follow that back up again with the, with the football finishing burr uh, because even though, yes, I want to reestablish the pits and grooves, I don't want anything that's too well defined because patients will finally get food caught in those areas and they'd rather have something that's smooth and more cleansable. So now I'll go back and refine that and, and uh, work out some of the more sharp areas that that last instrument caused and just make it more smooth. And so we're just taking a look around, making sure everything looks good. But I think I notice a problem right there interproximally. Looks like there's some flash that extended just to the uh, to the gingival, uh, right? Let's see if I can get this on the video. Right there, that would that would be uh, a place where they would snag their floss, and uh, it's a plaque trap. So we have to get that smooth. 
I'd be very cautious about using any kind of burr in that area. It's so easy to gouge that spot. So instead I'll use a hand instrument. Here just using a simple scaler, getting that, that piece removed. Uh, alternatively, you could go in with a number 12 blade. Uh, just try to go with a 12 as, as opposed to a 12B. You don't want that 12B to have that sharp edge on the other side and cut the gums. So uh, a blade or a scaler will, will get the job done. So just let's take another, take another look at it. I think I got that main piece of flash removed. There is a small little shoulder, it looks like. It's like a little bump. It's no longer going to be like a, like a floss catcher. But it's just an area we want to get smooth. Natural tooth is supposed to be smooth, so your fillings, they need to be smooth as well. So again, just work it a little bit more with that scaler. And of course, this is assuming you have a nice sharp scaler. And there, that, that pretty much wraps it up. Obviously, we can't check occlusion at this point, but I um, just want to show this basic steps and how we place a filling. Okay, looks like next we're going to uh, prepare the uh, the class 5. This tooth already had a notch in it for some reason. I don't remember why, but uh, let's go ahead and prep that. Unfortunately, this stone block is blocking my drill head from going into the exact position I want, but um, I just want to open up this, this prep and show what the steps we go through in, in placing a class 5 filling. Uh, sometimes if you can, you can put a retentive groove up underneath the occlusal part of the prep. You can go in with a small round burr and create just a more of a macro mechanical lock, but I find that most of the time you can, as long as you have a good enamel surface, you should be able to be alright with, with that. Alright, so we use a phosphoric etch. I'm going to go ahead and place it inside the prep and just uh, smear it actually outside beyond the extension of the actual prep itself. Uh, you see I put a little dab there on my glove. I would typically just do that on the patient's bib. But I know sometimes when you express that gel, it, uh, it wants to splatter. And I'd rather it splatter on the bib as opposed to splattering in the mouth. And uh, just got to let that set for about 15 seconds or so. There's a little air bubble. Let me get that out of there. Uh, I know some doctors like to go around the enamel first and then fill in the dentin. Uh, I, just, I just fill the whole thing in. Okay. So now it's been rinsed off. And it's been just dried. Of course, this uh, using the blue etch is more technique sensitive as far as not having any post-operative sensitivity. So you want to just again get it get it rinsed off and uh, get it so it's just barely have gotten dry. Uh, go in with our desensitizer and and uh, clean that out. And I find this the desensitizer. Of course, it desensitizes, but it just mechanically helps clean out the prep. So when you go through these next steps. It's a much cleaner surface, uh, you know, to put in to put in your bonding agents. Again, check to make sure we have nothing but air coming out of the air water tip, and just thin that material out. We're not trying to get a frosty appearance on the enamel. We just want to get it, get the excess off the tooth. Now we're going to go with um, this product called Adper, made by 3M SB. It's a single dose system. We pop the blister, it goes up into that next well, and the brush comes out, and it's loaded with our bonding agent. And uh, go ahead and scrub that into position. Again, just rotate it around, scrub it back and forth, get it out beyond the perimeter of the actual prep. And uh, you, know, you have to work it in there for a good 10, 15 seconds or so. Initially when you're doing this, if you need to count to yourself to make sure you're in there long enough, then then do that, but after a while you get a hang for it uh, for how long it needs to be. Uh, but you know, 10 15 seconds total amount of time before you cure. And by the time you scrub, you dab, you air thin, you start adding up all that time, it, it comes out to a good 15, 20, 25 seconds, which is great amount. Of, it was just that's great, a uh, perfect amount of time for that. Again, thin it absolutely, no water can be introduced at this point. And again, we're just thinning it out. Um, we don't want to blow it off the tooth, we just want to get it thin. And that is light cured.
and similar to what we did earlier. You could just go in with the regular hybrid composite, but I'm going to start with a, just a dab of flowable, just a little bit. We're not going to try to fill up the entire prep with flowable. Flowable shrinks too much, so you'll never fill an entire cavity prep unless it's like a sealant with a, with a flowable. And then put in our, our stronger, more durable hybrid composite. And that flowable will kind of ooze out of the way. And just ensuring that every little nook and cranny is being filled in. I slightly overfill it. I could use either this flat instrument or I could use the side of that packer or that plugger instrument instead. Uh, either way, just want to get it on there. Now, I've noticed that sometimes when I remove the instrument from the material, the material wants to come uh, or it kind of sticks to the, that instrument, it wants to almost come out. So what we do with class 5 is we use these, these uh, pre-curved matrices. And they come in three different sizes. I had that big fat one I had up there originally at the molar prep extended further we'd use that one. That one's going to be used more for canine although that could have worked. Uh, but let's try let's try the small one see if that one will work. Let's get it oriented the right way. Okay. And it looks like that will cover up the entire surface. Now usually I run the, the curing light but in this instance I'm going to have the assistant cure. I'm going to take and press into the tooth. Excess oozes out Assistant comes in and cures. Everything's being held still. Okay. And then I'll remove that. And I actually will go back again and cure. Just because that instrument that I was holding may have cast a shadow. It's very minor, but it still could have been a shadow that may cause some of the material not to have been completely cured. Okay, so now the filling is in there. I did it all in one increment. If it was a much deeper filling, that may do two increments. Uh, but I think just one in this case is okay. Uh, flame shape finishing burr. This is a pretty quick cleanup. Uh, I always have to make sure that there's nothing going to be stuck underneath the gum line. No flash, uh, no bonding agent. Um, since there's no gingiva on this example, um, I won't be checking that, but I would in the mouth I would take an explorer and just feel along subgingibly to make sure there's nothing uh, that's extended out there that's going to be a plaque trap and cause gingival inflammation later. Okay, so just clean that up and that's it. If you want to, you could take some discs to it or a polisher, uh, but I find that it, that, uh, that fluted carbide does a pretty good job just the way it is. So we clean it off and that's it. So there we go, we placed three fillings. Uh, that would occur much faster if we were doing this intraorally, but that's how we do fillings. Hopefully this has been helpful for you. Thanks.